So here's my makeup version for week number seven because obviously I didn't record it. So this week we have a few big ideas. We're not going to get through all of it this week, but that's okay. Um, so we'll talk about PCR to determine genotypes. And then we'll look at some chi-squares and inheritance patterns and what does and what does not follow Mendel. Some resources. For quiz number three, here are some questions I would ask you. And here are some short questions. So the first topic is going to be how do we know the genotypes and phenotypes? Like how could we validate this molecularly? So the easiest way for us to do this is using tDNA and plants. So there's a plant pathogen called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, and part of what it does is it has this plasmid called the TI plasmid, tumor-inducing plasmid. And part of it is this bit of DNA called the tDNA, the transfer or the tumor DNA. It gets transferred into the host bacterium, actually, sorry, the host plant, and it'll induce this tumor. So what we can do is we can intentionally strip out all the bad parts from the tDNA and let this bacterium just randomly insert the tDNA into plants. And what we can do is we can check for mutants, especially if that tDNA goes into an exon. And the result is we can make all sorts of plant mutants and we can track where the mutation happens because we can track where the tDNA turns out to be. We give it two ends, one's called the left border and one's called the right border, and we know those sequences. The way that we identify it is using PCR. So you make these tDNA mutants, and what we wanna do is find some weird phenotypes. So the plant's too small, it's too short, it has some type of delayed physiologic function, it happens too quickly, something is exaggerated, something like that. And what we can do is once we find those plants is we can sequence around where the tDNA is and we can figure out what gene it is using blast searches. And what we can then do is once we have that, we can establish some PCR primers to determine if you have a homozygous or a heterozygous plant. What we're looking for are two different PCR product sizes. It all will depend on how you design your primers. So either you're gonna be aiming for two different product sizes or we're looking for a present, not present. So I'm going to describe this method, but a lot of the pictures I'm gonna show you is gonna deal with this top one. So one version would be, if there's no tDNA, what I do is I would use a left primer and a right primer a forward and reverse, and that would give me a certain size fragment. What I could also do is I can connect a border and a primer, and what I can do is, so this would be a left and a right, and what I could do is connect and see how big is this PCR product, or how big is this PCR product. And obviously that would be a lot smaller, hopefully, than these two or it'd be a different size than the original so we can make a primer pair if there's no tDNA and we can make a primer pair if there is tDNA and I should get different product sizes then what I just need to do is run the PCR what I would hopefully see is if you're wild type meaning you're heterozygous or homozygous for being normal you'd get one particular type of band if you're homozygous for the tDNA insertion, you would get a different size band. And if you are heterozygous, you should get two different size bands. One to indicate wild type, meaning no tDNA, and one meaning you have the tDNA. This then just becomes a game of can you read the gel? Electrophoresis is the technique that we use, and that's separating DNA by size because DNA turns out to be negatively charged and its shape is relatively uniform, it makes it re really easy. We'll load the DNA into some wells. We're going to apply an electric field. So we have a cathode and an anode. The electric field will run 
towards the red electrode and they will separate all the DNA by size. Once we've done that, it's pretty easy. I just need to see if I got the bands where I want them to be. If I were to use the version where, because I told you that we either have a version where we get two different PCR product sizes, or we get a yes or a no. If we're doing the yes-no version, what you would do is you'd run an LPRP. So LPRPs would be these two. And that should show up in non-mutants. LBP, left border primer of the tDNA, RP, should only appear in mutants. So this PCR utilizes the tDNA itself. So if you don't happen to have a tDNA mutant, or you don't have a chromosome with that, then it shouldn't show up. So you can interpret uh, gels this way. Here, this is actually being done using, you know, a left border primer and a right primer, then we have a left and a right primer. These two here give a much larger fragment than do, does these two. So the result is when I look at these different lines, this first bit here is called a marker. So these are just pieces of DNA of known size. All we have to do is read the gel. So for individual number one, I see two bands. That means heterozygous. Person two, or plant two, heterozygous. Plant three only has a big band. So that means plant number three is homozygous, four being wild type. What would it look like if you had a plant that was homozygous for this tDNA insertion? All I would see is a line on the bottom, and I would not see a line on the top. Well, what does it mean if you have something like here in number 16, where it's faint? That just means that it wasn't a great PCR reaction. Either the you didn't have a, or in this particular case, it's probably you didn't have enough DNA, or it could be, you know, you just did a bad job loading the gel, which sometimes can be the case because this marker in some of these is kind of wanting that's okay. But that's how we figure out genotypes, molecularly speaking, at least in plants. If you're talking about animals, we'd have to figure out a different way to do that, usually probably by looking at a mutation, or if you can design primers that are at mutation points, and then you can see whether or not it works or not. <coughs> so then how do you get that triple mutant? So step number one is we're going to find a recessive for one trait, and recessive for a second trait. So if I have a plant and it's recessive for trait B, what I would say is it's just a recessive B. That would be its phenotype. That's implying that, assuming we're not having anything weird going on, especially if these are tDNA insertions, that I should have it be homozygous dominant for those other traits. So the only thing I'm caring about would be recessive B on the left, recessive A on the right. And we don't talk about everything that's normal. When I cross these two, I'm going to get my F1, and that's going to get me a double heterozygote that will have a normal phenotype. I'm going to self this one, and this is going to give me the F2, or what I'm going to try and hunt for is the double mutant. Well, probability-wise... It should be 1 16th. That does not tell me how many I need to actually look for. That 1 16th is when you have your data, you should see that pattern. But that pattern also only shows up when you have lots of seeds that you're looking at. So how many seeds should we examine to find it? There was this formula from last week. I would plug in the odds of failure. If the odds of success are a 16th, the odds of failure are 15 sixteenths. I solve for x, and what I'm going to get is 47 seeds. So for a 1 out of 16th odds, I have to look at 47 
to start to see that trend appear to almost three times that amount. Once I have my double mutant, what I'm going to do is take this double mutant and I'm going to cross it with my third mutant that I'm looking for. So I have my double mutant, a single mutant. I'm going to cross these. I'm going to get a phenotypic normal, F1. I will self my F1. And I'm going to then hunt for my triple mutant. My triple mutant, the odds of finding that turn out to be a 64th. So if I plug, well, 63 out of 64 into this equation, solve for X, I have to check 191 seeds to find it. And then obviously if you start asking questions like, oh, what were the odds of finding five of them? Well, then you have to multiply, you know, the 64th times five, and, or by itself five times. So it's 64th to the fifth power. So what non-standard Mendelian genetics exist? The most basic one that we know of are probably from prior classes. So one of those is what we call codominance. This is when everything is expressed. So A and B in blood groups turn out to be that. So if you are type A and type B, if you were to mix those together, you are type A and you are type B. You're not one or the other, you are both. And that's what we mean by being co-dominant. Incomplete dominance is neither one is actually dominant, neither one is actually recessive. So flower colors turned out to be a famous example of this. So if you were to have a red carnation and cross it with a white carnation, what you actually get is a pink carnation. You can also see it here with these flowers where you get these gradations of color. It's not one or the other, it's a blending. You could also have multiple alleles, meaning it's not just two choices, you have multiple choices. The catch when we have multiple alleles is there's a series of relationships that also exist. For blood typing, especially if it's an ABO blood type, we actually have three alleles. They're written as A, or IA, IB, and I. The reason why we use an I is because this is an immune um, way of checking. We use uh, clotting. Allele series exist when we happen to have multiple alleles. And it's trying to figure out what trait is dominant to what. And the only way that you could figure this out is by doing problems, meaning here's the cross, here's the outcome, let's figure it out. You can't just look and know what the answer is. So if we were to look at mallard ducks, and we look at their plumage, it turns out you have to look at the male ducks to figure this out because the females aren't the fancy ones. So we only see this expressed in the males. So we'd actually call this a sex-limited phenomenon. So there's a type called restricted, and that's when they're missing this front plumage or frontal color. And these try to be the genotypes of those restricted. So you could be homozygous, heterozygous, and heterozygous. But notice how each of them have a capital M, then a big R. The mallard version, which is the standard duck that we think of, can be a homozygous mallard or a heterozygous. We also have dusky, which is, it looks like they were start, the mallard was trying to get a little fluffy in the front, but it didn't quite make it there. But they also have the same size as being restricted. It turns out to be homozygous only. If I compare these, the restricted appearance always seems to have a big MR. So that means this one wins. When we look at the mallard, it could be homozygous big M or it could be heterozygous. So that means the big M is dominant to MD, which is this. When I stick it all together, I get this pattern. And we call this an allele series. We could figure out the exact same thing for human blood typing. It turns out to be this. So AI is equal to I, or IA is equal to IB. So they're co-dominant, and both of these are dominant to.
to I. So here's an example for allele series that we worked. What we happen to have are some crosses, and we're only going to look at the first three crosses. So if I look at cross number one, with these corn kernels, we're going to have sun red cross pink. We get nothing but sun red. The F2, I get a three to one ratio of sun reds to pinks. What that tells me is sun red is dominant to pink. Cross two, orange cross sun red, <coughs> gives me nothing but sun red. Selfing the sun reds gets me a three to one ratio of sun reds to orange. So sun red is, sun red is dominant to orange. Orange cross pink gives me nothing but orange. If I self the F1, I get a three to one ratio of oranges to pinks. So that tells me orange is dominant to pink. This bottom one here, that, that, that's uh, something else is going on. We'll talk about it later. So what this tells me is sun red is dominant to orange, which is dominant to pink. Because these are probably all dealing with the same gene, what we are gonna say is, I'm gonna put it as a recessive allele, so I'll do a little a, now put sun red as a superscript, little a, orange as a super, as a sub, superscript, not a subscript, little a, then, p, then the pink as a superscript. Because we have a wild type here, wild type is usually gonna be the dominant, so that will just be a capital A. So obviously, the dominant is dominant to everything else. We will worry about cross four later. There's also a phenomenon referred to as pleiotropy, which is when you have one gene with multiple phenotypes. There's several examples of these, like Drosophila white eyes. You can have the white eye phenotype. It also turns out to be lethal. The SRY gene turns out to code for, quote, maleness, unquote, so it actually alters a lot of anatomy and physiology. CFTR, this deals with cystic fibrosis, so it causes issues with digestion, causes issues with breathing. Um, I don't remember what the disease is, but it's been associated with some type of disease resistance. Marfan syndrome has to do with connective tissues and their weakening, but also makes you limber and it makes you tall. Lethal alleles are an example of pleiotropy. So a lethal allele is if you have these alleles, you're going to die. Normally with lethality, it's recessive, meaning the only way that it shows up is you have to be homozygous. The phenotype that's also associated with it, meaning the other phenotype, because it is pleiotropic, is usually a dominant. So to see the, pheno the non-lethal phenotype, you just need one copy. But to see the lethality, you need two copies. So here, this would turn out to be what we would call the, um, the yellow mouse issue. So if you were to cross these mice called agouti mice, you get nothing but a goody, they all survive. If I cross yellow mice, it turns out you get two thirds of them are yellow, a third of them are a goody. And you would say, wait, thirds? I thought things are in fourths. Usually when you start to see thirds show up, it's telling you that we have lethality. A goody cross a yellow gives you actually half a goody, half yellow, and it's a 50-50 split. That's because we're following the heterozygous cross the recessive. There's several examples of this. Achondroplasia in humans, which is when your long bones don't grow. So it's a form of dwarfism. The Manx cat is the tailless cat. It's because they don't form vertebrae. Huntington's disease is actually a weird one. It's actually referred to as a lethal dominant. Here is an example that we worked. This was actually a little bit more complicated, but it still get works. So if you have a virgin Drosophila, you know that the bristles are shorter than normal, so SB. You made her with a normal bristle male. The progeny are a third short bristle female, a third short bristle or normal bristle male, and a third normal bristle male. If I cross the female and brothers, 
it's all normal bristle. But if I cross the short bristle female and brothers, you get the exact same ratio. So provide an explanation of these results. So I didn't do all of the crosses, but whenever we do this, notice how there's never any short bristle males. What this is telling us is there's lethality associated with that short bristle. So there's something about short bristles that are lethal that are affecting the males. When it's affecting the males but not the females, it's what we refer to as being sex-linked. These two confuse everyone. So penetrance and expressivity. So the concept of penetrance is you have the allele. The question is, does it show up? So the concept of penetrance is how often do you see it? So if you were to have 100 people who happen to have the allele, but only two of them show it, we would call that a 2% penetrance. In terms of expressivity, that's the degree to which you have the expression, meaning do you have, does it show up a whole bunch? Does it show up a little bit? So the famous example of this is polydactyly. So polydactyly is when you start forming extra digits. It turns out to have reduced penetrance, meaning it doesn't, you can have the allele and it doesn't appear. When it does show up, we're not entirely sure how badly it will appear. It can show up as just one extra digit. It could show up as 10 extra digits. It could show up as 20 extra digits. That is what we mean by expressivity. How much does it appear? Penetrance is how frequently does it show up amongst the people who have the allele. Clearly what's going on here is there's some other factors at play that are helping regulate what's going on. We could also have traits or phenotypes that involve many genes. And this is because we have to have a multiple enzyme pathway involved. And the way that we can test if these, that there's more than one gene involved is what we call the complementation test. So what we have to do is get a whole bunch of knockouts and we just need to see what shows up. The term complementation means the restoration of the wild type. So we put the original back, they complement each other. So if we look here, this figure actually does a nice job. So we have two flies that are wingless. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cross these two flies and if they turn out to have an offspring that has wings, what that tells me is these two mutations are in different genes. So if complementation occurs, meaning we restore the wild type, we go from wingless to winged, that means that these two flies have different genes affected. How does that manifest? Well, the one on the left has a mutation in gene one, the one on the right has a mutation in gene two. When they cross, the fly on the left will contribute one chromosome, the one on the right will contribute another chromosome. And when I compare these, for gene number one, the fly is heterozygous, so it has a good copy. The one on the right, the gene two, there's also a good copy. And having these two good copies is more than enough to restore the phenotype. If, however, as is shown here in case two, we have our two wingless flies, we do a complementation test, and the mutation is in the same gene, even though they are different versions, different mutations in that gene, the result is that first gene is still knocked down, which means we do not get complementation and the fly still has a mutate, you know, still doesn't look like it's wild type. It still is missing gene or missing its wings. Here's the example that we ended with. Uh, yeah, this is where we ended. So this is looking at nematodes. So normally they wiggle, but you could also have these gliders. So they found six gliders 
and what they did was each of these were crossed. So one was crossed with one because they can be hermaphroditic. What you get is the uh, wiggle. So we didn't get complementation, but when you take one and two and cross them, you do get complementation. We get the wild type back. What we're interested in doing these problems is finding where complementation failed. So if I look just at number one, one and four, there was no complementation. So one and four turn out to not complement. What that means is one and four have the same gene that's taken out. It might be in different ways, but it's the same gene. If I look at two, two and three turn out to not complement, and two and six turn out to not complement. So that means two, three, and six are probably sharing the same gene. We can double check this, three and six, it's also not complementing, so indeed they're the same gene. And what we'll then notice is we never get any complementation, or we only get complementation after that. So one and four share one gene, we'll call it A. Two, three, and six are sharing a gene, we'll call it B. So then what happened to number five? Clearly it must be a separate gene, C. So how many genes result in the Wiggler phenotype? At least three genes. And that's because that's what our complementation test is showing us. So what we look for in a complementation test is no complementation. So when we look for no complementation, that's telling us that there's a gene involved. And now you are caught up.